Morning all. I'd like to show you the round 21 encounter between Robert James Fisher and Vasily Smyslov of the Bled Zagreb Belgrade tournament of 1959. Smyslov was a Soviet and Russian grandmaster, world champion from 1957 to 58. So not, not long before this tournament, in fact, he was candidate for the World Chess Championship on eight occasions, 1948, 50, 53, 56, 59, 65, 83 and 85. Smyslov twice tied for first at the Soviet Championship, 1949, 1955, and his total of 17 Chess Olympiad medals won is an all-time record. In five European team championships, Smyslov won 10 gold medals. He remained active and successful in competitive chess well into the 60s and 70s, qualifying for the finals of the World Championship candidates matches as late as 1983. Okay, let's have a look at this encounter in round 21. This is not a game featured in Fisher's Memorable Games book. Instead, the encounter after in round 28 is shown with Fisher playing black. Interestingly, Fisher, after kicking off with e4, Smyslov chose the Sicilian defence. It had seemed many of the other Russian players in the tournament wanted to torture Fisher with the Kara Khan, sensing a kind of weakness in Fisher's treatments of the uh, two knights formation of the Kara Khan. But Smyslov dared play the Sicilian in this game. Knight f3, we see e6. D4, C takes, Knight takes, Knight F6, Knight C3, and now this move D6. So the Scheveningen pawn structure here in the center is very flexible. Bishop C4, Bishop E7, Fischer now castled. He's playing the Fischer Sozin attack system here with this bishop on c4 and often white's plan is to kind of extend the scope of it trying to smash down black center with a later f4 f5 as a general plan a6 bishop b3 b5 now here one could argue uh should white be playing a3 thing is is a, it's a bit of a loss of time but um the interesting point uh, to raise here is uh, a a3 was was considered a, a major omission uh, in Fisher's memorable games but in their round 28 encounter and here it does seem fairly important to safeguard the e4 pawn so there's an interesting background context here doesn't white want to safeguard the e4 pawn and is there any problem with black uh, playing b4 which can be exploited technically with what we know um, and perhaps using engines. And for those of you interested, there is a very high tech move here I've discovered. Uh, in live book, actually, um, this this is a rare bird, 27 games with what I'm about to show you. Uh, the most usual move is Queen F3, 1030 games. F4 is 215 games. But this next move I want to show you just briefly is Bishop E3. Uh, just from a technical point of view, if black can be provoked for B4, there is a slight problem here, knight a4, and that b6 is a bit sensitive. For example, knight takes e4, white has the resource knight b6. This is very interesting stuff. Queen takes, knight takes e6, discovering attack on the queen. Knight c5, bishop takes, d takes, knight takes g7, king f8. Queen d5, double attacks a8 and f7. And white would be doing very, very well in this position. It's not all force, it's just a, an idea, a high-tech move discovered by engines here, that bishop e3. But the most usual move, as I mentioned, is queen f3, apparently, queen f3. Okay, and um, for example, queen c7, queen g3, we have this continuation. So why it's not touching the f, f pawn, but in this game, Fisher did touch the f pawn after the move b5 and this isn't um this this is the second um most popular move f4 but the idea usually 
of this move after Black Castling <coughs> pardon me is to play an immediate break here with e5 98 games for e5 here bishop e3 34 a3 28 the idea is usually to play an immediate break with e5 and that's a very interesting uh, move breaking up the position like this and now for example bishop e3 offering the pawn pawn sacrifice and there's a lot of pressure here for white this kind of position you can see that white's extending the scope of many of his pieces that bishop's nice on the diagonal etc so the prospects are okay but in this game we see actually uh, the move f5 and this move is quite provocative because what of the e4 pawn isn't this week isn't b4 at all an issue for white well it's tested here b4 is played and the knight doesn't really want to go to a4 here without any particular purpose as a decentralizing move it goes to e2 and it seems the e4 pawn um, might be vulnerable once black resolves the issue on e6 which he does e5 kicking in a knight this knight back and here it does seem as though it might be tempting to play knight uh, takes e4 and you might ask well hold on a sec knight takes e4 isn't there bishop d5 doesn't this this punish this no no it doesn't because black in this position has a resource of check throwing in this check and bishop b7 and black's doing very well here uh, but in fact the pawn doesn't have to be taken there's no rush uh, to even take this pawn in this position and an even stronger move really is played here uh, in this position just bishop b7 arguably a stronger move uh, leaving white yeah basically he's losing uh, you know what consider him a very important central pawn and so so how can this be used as a kind of gambit can white get some sort of attack or can he get a bind on the d5 square somehow he plays knight g3 and the initial impression now uh, black does take the opportunity here uh, to take the pawn but it might even be possible just just to delay that and try further torture on that pawn with knight bd7 with the idea of knight c5 but here the pawn is committedly kind of taken so can white really punish this here fisher takes on e4 bishop takes e4 so it's an interesting pawn sack and you you might think well is, is bishop d5 useful it might not be a great uh, blockader to just take on d5 leaving the queen there uh, but even better you know throwing the check then take on d5 and this isn't a good blockader at all uh, this position is just just better for, for black so that that isn't a good idea so white wants to try and get some attacking compensation fisher plays queen e1 and he's positively encouraging black to be greedy to take another pawn let's just have a quick look at this bishop takes f5 there's knight takes e5 discovering an attack on the bishop here this isn't so hot this position uh, so this is this would be giving white strong compensation now pressure on f7 beautiful bishop on the diagonal so no black doesn't want to take on f5 here um, he actually plays quite a committal move giving up the light square bishop perhaps bishop c6 is interesting in this position uh, but uh, he actually played bishop takes f3 and we see rook takes f3 another point is revealed he wants to use c6 for the knight to aggressively put the knight on d4 now with tempo against this rook but white is permitted it seems to set up a temporary bind on the d5 square here with Fisher's next move queen e4 encouraging knight d4 for a moment rook h3 there's a serious threat now actually of f6 threatening h7 f6 is a major threat that needs to be parried which is parried now with bishop f6 but now this bind looks quite convincing compared to before using the bishop 
So this structure is pacifying a bit the bishop. Well, this bishop on d5 seems quite useful, striking out on these two diagonals. The rook moves, attacking c3. And white now plays c3. B takes, B takes, leaving the knight with only, it seems, one useful square, which is enough. Knight b5 attacking c3 pawn. Fisher defends that. And then we see this move rook c5. And it's apparently here, black wants to you know, lift this d5 blockade. And rook c5 helps facilitate that. Knight c7, for example, next. And then d5, and then if e4, this bishop is going to enjoy this diagonal. So can black unravel? Knight c7, and even maybe it looks very provocative to play queen a5, but that might even be a useful uh, pin here. This is an unprotected piece in this position. So queen a5 might not be uh, such a bad resource as well. But knight c7, a more straightforward one, to try and lift this blockade on d5. White plays king h1. And now, actually, not knight uh, c7 here. What could white do if white's going back? This might be okay for white, but it looks a little bit dangerous for king safety, potentially. Um, Smyslov's next move actually is queen d7 here. So putting pressure on f5. What is black actually threatening? Well, knight c7 remains on the cards here. And perhaps in light of that, bishop drops back voluntarily, which does seem to uh, allow black to liberate in the center with d5 now. So he's got this center. Can he do something with it? It looks quite impressive. So the bind has gone, disappeared. And now we see an interesting knight centralization offering d5. So let's see what would happen if bishop takes d5. Rook d8 now threatens e4 because there's an unprotected bishop still on d2 and e4 is pretty nasty as a threat here. What does white want to do here? If he moves bishop back e4, queen e2, rook takes f5 and black stands better. Nice protected pawn in the center. So, in this position, we see actually rook f1 not going for d5, just holding up f5. But now knight e4 attacks the bishop on d2. Instead of moving that, Fisher plays for a mate with mating one that needs to be parried. So the idea is to force h6. Um, any other move? Not entirely sure. This this might not be losing by force. Let's just check this. Check. And here, if the king's got e7, it's not. It's not convincing that white's attack should be winning here. But um, Smyslov just played simply h6, provoking a, a peace sacrifice, leaving that to be chipped now with his next move. Bishop takes h6, sacrificing the bishop looks quite brutal and aggressive. But black's got that huge knight in the center. Can this attack really be sound in this position? It is taken. And now not the straightforward queen takes h6. I'm not entirely sure it does anything with this bishop protecting h8. For example, rook d8. Let's say bishop c2, just to try and snap this off for rook g3 to be more effective. Bishop g7, check. King f8, taking here. f6, I can just take this. There's a back row issue for white's king here. So rook takes f6 is not on the cards. Rook h6, queen c6, black's doing very well. So with queen c6, 
there's still uh, the back row issue like rook takes f6 queen takes f6 just to try and deflect so this back row issue is an important resource to, to try and um, it creates important resources for black even at this point in the game here to consider uh, white tries to make rook g3 check more effective by playing bishop c2 and now it seems black missed the chance to just wipe out this attacking resource here. I mean this bishop fundamentally is blocked in by its own pawn on di that diagonal. It seems that rook takes c3 would be really strong here. For example bishop takes we just take and then there's no there's nothing there's no real problem here. Uh, rook takes c3 doesn't seem white's able to do much uh, if queen takes rook takes uh, if white wants to try and do this this looks very ambitious but does it actually do anything this kind of position is always knight f2 check and bishop takes h6 this is embarrassing so white can't really uh, do anything apart from queen takes h3 that's actually and there's no attack here again so it seems rook takes c3 would have knocked out some attacking resources in this position after this bishop c2 uh, rook takes c3 does appear playable here but uh, it's been sort of played bishop g5 and there's still something for white to play for here it is still a little bit dangerous he plays f6 which might not be the best test of bishop g5 uh, perhaps taking here now d takes he's still got this active attacking resource here so rook g3 uh, would force it seems f6 uh, white is now threatening queen takes h6 so how does black want to defend this position if he had this position uh, it's getting a little bit on the dangerous side but f6 h4 black could play queen e8 and a simplification here you know is not desirable queen g4 queen f7 okay black would still be better here and the attacks gone but um in the game we see actually fisher playing uh instead of uh after f6 instead of bishop takes e4 f6 here and Smyslov now plays rook b8 so this back row could be a problem after bishop e4 for b1 to be useful and indeed what can white play if he doesn't take the knight he wants to play off to play rook g3 so he does actually snap off the knight in, in you know justifying that rook can be using b1 here d takes rook g3 and here okay it seems initially quite dangerous that white is threatening queen takes h6 and rook takes g5 here but there's a great resource of course uh, possible now if you can find it I'll give you 10 seconds can you spot what black can play here in this position so 10 seconds starting from now okay a shot a cold shower is given to white's attack here with this next move queen f5 really emphasizing the importance of the rook being able to come down for this back row issue trying to deflect this rook away from the back row this signifies the end of white's attacking prospects because now uh, after king g1 which is virtually the only 
reasonable move here. Um, black can just play now queen g6, defending. So peace up for a moment. And the game continues. Queen e2. White's still threatening h4 though. So white's still got that threat of h4. But this gives black time now. And he uses that time to play rook c6. So h4 at least gets the piece back. And you might not think it's that bad. Rook takes f6. Rook takes f6. Queen takes f6. And here, instead of just taking the piece back immediately, Fisher plays queen h5. Spinsov now plays queen f4, attacking the rook. King protects the rook. And now we see uh, the move king g7, which might actually not be the most crushing way to play this. If we look at this engine move rook d8 for a sec, let's have a look at this. So if hg here, just rook d3, and that's pretty nasty on that pin. So that would be uh, pretty nasty indeed. Queen g4, h5, it's horrible. Horrible ending, forcing the undoubling of the pawns. This pawn is crashing through. So it's it's pretty miserable after rook d8, but king g7 was played, which is still uh, favorable for black actually, because after hg, hg, the rook being pinned, so white has to get the queens off. And okay, again, you might not think initially this is such a big deal. It's only a pawn, being a pawn down, and it's double pawns here. The problem with this position after king f6 is this pawn is quite a menace actually in this position. It's quite a menace. Uh, how can it be stopped, in fact? Uh, Fisher's move is actually rook h5. If we tried rook g3, then okay, rook g3, rook b2. This rook and pawn ending is a lot of fun for black. Uh, if any rook e3, there's always king f5 as an option as well. So in the game, though, Fisher played rook h5 and now we see rook b1 with basically the threat of e3, e2, e1 queening. King tries to come to the rescue, but it's cut off now with rook f1. Again, e3, e2, e1 as a threat. Fisher tries rook h4. The king protects that for a moment. Check. And the king goes back to e6. So did black make progress there? With the king just being uh, evicted back. Well, the king on e6 is a slight improvement. It means the f pawn is not blocked. So that f5 becomes possible. But we see Fisher throwing in the check here, f6. Rook h4. And you might think, well, hang on a sec, isn't just f5 possible here? Yes, it is possible, but uh, even simpler now is black can lure the rook to e4 by playing e3. Uh, this is definite threat e2 and just queening, forcing rook e4 basically, if white is interested in stopping the pawn. But now Spizzlov's next move is crushing. I wonder if you can spot it. It's the final move of the game. What does black play here? I'll give you 10 seconds starting from now. Okay, Spizzle just plays f5, just encouraging the rook to take the pawn. But then, alas, f4 check. So Fisher actually had to resign here. If the rook moves off, of course, e2. If he takes, then there's f4 check, just winning the rook. So he had to resign here. 
so this was the round 21 game of course um, perhaps not so not so nice for Fisher but it was the prelude to the memorable game we see in Fisher's memorable game book of round 28 which we recently featured on this channel as well if you want to see the tw round 28 encounter so actually this was Fisher's only loss to Vasily Smyslov ever uh, their overall score is something like 3-1 on classical games and a few draws but uh, this is the only time Vasily Smyslov beat Fisher and I'm not entirely sure if uh, it has been video annotated by any channel up till now on YouTube which is a bit of a shame you know Smyslov was a great world champion and uh, it's interesting to see you know his win against Fisher in this tournament of 1959. Comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.